Yes, I'm gonna lay. It has taken a village to put everything together for you today and for the next few days. Please remember that all sessions will be recorded and available for you until February 28th, 2022. First, I would like to thank the conference committee for putting this event together. The committee consists of Sister Mary Helen Kashuba, Thomasina White, Melissa Moran, David Brightville, Katie Gear, and myself. Then I would especially like to recognize Dr. Richard Madel, who has been the engineer, the architect, the major operator and tech guru in the planning, the communicating and the executing of this virtual conference. We will be forever indebted to him. Here, here, Rich. Before we begin, I would also like to send a warm welcome to all of you, especially to the 13% of our total registrants who are war language student teachers. They are our future. And furthermore, I'd like to extend an invitation to each and every one of you present here today to get more involved. We need more teacher leaders to join PSMLA and to share their talents and their energies. Please consider becoming more involved with our association. If you have any questions on how you can contribute more to world language education, feel free to please contact me at john at psmla.org. Also, please remember that our Pennsylvania Language Forum, our journal, is always looking for articles or lesson plans that excite and motivate our students and our teachers. Please share your ideas and your lessons with us so that we can share them with all of our members so that their students can become more successful and engaged in learning a new language. By the way, save the date for next year's conference, which we anticipate will be live, face-to-face, -face, yes, in Lancaster. The date for next year's conference are October 13th through the 15th, 2022. And please visit our website often. We offer many uh, professional development opportunities and awards and other things at www.psmla.org. Next, I would like to introduce Dr. Rich Madel, who will briefly walk us through some of the highlights of the conference program. And then he in turn will introduce our keynote speaker, Rebecca Blua. Rich. Gracias, Presidente. Um, so I don't want to take for granted that this format is uh, is comfortable for anybody. Uh, and so I really wanted to just make sure, take just a, a brief moment to kind of walk us through and make sure we felt comfortable with how the, the conference is organized. Um, we all received a version of the conference program. Um, perhaps one of the most useful pages of this program is going to be the table of contents. This table of contents is uh, interactive, so it'll take you wherever you need to go. So for example, if you were to click on the schedule overview, it will give you a sense of what we have on any given day. So for example, today, some of you may have gotten to our opening session by clicking on the opening session and clicking on the title of the session itself. At the footer of all of our conference pages, you'll have the option to return to the table of contents and it'll send you right back. So tomorrow, for example, you can go directly to Thursday's concurrent page at four o'clock. And from here, you can click on any title and it will send you directly to any session at any given time. At the footer, you'll also have uh, some important forms that will help you get credit for this conference. For example, your Act 48 form is at the footer of all of our conference pages. We appreciate the feedback that you can provide for any of the sessions that you attend. So the session evaluation form is here as well. And if at any point you have any questions, concerns about technology or about how the conference is organized, you can fill out this form that will notify a conference organizer uh, and that will make sure that we can get back to you as well. Lastly, you will also find a page here where you can engage with the conference uh, exhibitors and sponsors. 
Um, and on these dates in particular, there will be representatives here that you can that you can engage with. You can learn a little bit more about what they have to offer. You can ask questions, whatever you'd like to do. We will record attendance of those sessions. And at the very end, we will raffle off 10 $25 Amazon gift cards as a little bit of an incentive to, uh, to say hello and show some face to our corporate sponsors. Um, so with that being said, I think that just about does it for the orientation. At this point, I really have the distinguished honor to present to you our opening keynote speaker, Rebecca Blue Wolf. Um, over the years, I have gotten, uh, I've been able to familiarize myself with Rebecca and her body of work. And I am sincere when I tell you that she is as generous as she is thoughtful with the work that she shares with the field. She truly embodies the theme of this conference, and that is bridging differences with languages. She is an outspoken advocate for engaging really big ideas, even with just really small language. Rebecca Blue Wolf has taught French at Wesley Middle School in Massachusetts for over 20 years. She has been a Fulbright teaching scholar in France. She has been Massachusetts uh, Teacher of the Year, Nectful's Teacher of the Year, and in 2020, representing all of us, Actful's Teacher of the Year. And so really quickly, before I hand it over to Rebecca, I will say, if you are tweeting or you are posting on social media, we welcome you to include at PSMLA1. You can include the hashtag PSMLA21 so that we can see and share all of your thoughts. Uh, Rebecca's uh, Twitter handle is at Madame Blue Wolf. And if you would like to tag her, please do so. So without further ado, Rebecca Blue Wolf. Thank you, Rich. Thank you, John. Hello, Pennsylvania, all the way from Massachusetts. It's a beautiful sunny day here, but I heard you have sort of a more drizzly thing, which is probably better suited to spending your afternoon attending a conference. So hopefully I'm not taking you away from any sunbathing, et cetera. And since we're a pretty small group, I just wanted to invite people, if you wanna just drop in the chat um, your first name and the level and language or languages that you teach or that you are preparing to teach. I was really excited to hear that we have some maybe future teachers in the crowd. I just modeled that in the chat and it would be great to get a sense of who's out there. So we can chase, just take a minute to introduce ourselves. I'll get the slides set up while you do that. All right, so many flavors of Spanish. We've got some German, middle school Chinese. I am the mother of a middle school Chinese student. Higher ed folks. Middle school French, woo! Edith, Edith. Student teacher, hooray! What a year to be a student teacher. Pascal, representing middle school French as well. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, listen, welcome everyone. I'm super glad to be here. Rich, does everything look okay in terms of screen sharing on your end? Okay, awesome. So my plan is to speak for about 30 minutes and there will be some opportunities for audience participation, for a little self-reflection, and then there will be an action item at the end. So I'm hoping that this will kick off a wonderful conference. I cannot imagine how much work this has been to organize the whole usual conference thing, like every piece of it still exists. And then on top of that, we add this entire digital overlayer. So it's it's really quite a feat. And um, yeah, thank you for all of your efforts to bring us together today. It is always a joy to be together with other world language teachers. And today I had the very special privilege of being together with my department, sixth through 12th grade, in person for a collegial discussion about checking for understanding. It was our first time in a room together in well over 18 months. And just the excitement of being able to talk to other people who like to nerd out on the same topics was really thrilling. So this is just the whole day is like a power day now of learning with this talk with you all. And so what I'm going to be speaking about is this idea of thoughtful curation. 
and how the way that we curate the texts that we use in our classrooms is a way to bring us toward anti-bias education in our world in language our classrooms. And I've just got the hashtag for you there as a reminder. And I wanted to start with this image because I think in many ways it sort of represents how I taught for at least the first decade of my career. I was really, really locked in to my textbook. And I was very proud of the fact that I taught every chapter and that we always finished and that uh, the high school teachers loved me because they like knew I had taught every single thing in the book. There was like nothing that we didn't get to. And then I went to this really mind-blowing Nectful workshop with Laura Terrell, and she started talking about thematic units and how much of what we teach do the students actually learn and retain. And sort of my world just kind of fell apart. And I think Laura Terrell is an amazing teacher, and I also think when the student is ready, the teacher appears. And so that was kind of the moment in my career where I was able to sort of break free of those textbook chains. And I started thinking about writing my own curriculum, which I had absolutely no preparation to do other than this Keys to Planning for Teaching Learning book by Laura Terrell and Donna Clementi. And I spent a summer trying to write thematic units and I was trying to find all these authentic resources. And it was a big hot mess. And one of the things that I thought so much about was, oh, like all this work that the textbook company had to do to assemble all those resources and select which ones, now that's on me. Now I have to be the curator. And it's like all those little culture boxes that I hated and the stereotype about Haitian people on this one page that was really appalling in my Discovering French textbook, now, now it's on me to make all those choices. And, and I made plenty of mistakes and I am still revamping my curriculum and things that were good in 2015 when I started this work, now they're looking a little old and tired. So it's certainly not a job that's done, um, but I think that more and more world language teachers are being asked to assume the responsibility of curating the texts that are part of our classroom. And so I really wanted to talk about sort of how do we do that? How do we do that well? And how do we choose materials that can fight bias, which is certainly one of the most pressing issues of our time. So I wanted to bring here the words of Dr. Rudine Sims Bishop, who's a scholar in literature for young people. So I'm gonna read this to you and she talks about books, but I would invite you to sort of hear that more as all the resources that are part of my course all of the learning materials that I use. So she says, books are sometimes windows, offering views of worlds that may be real or imagined, familiar or strange. These windows are also sliding glass doors and readers have only to walk through in imagination to become part of whatever world has been created or recreated by the author. When lighting conditions are just right, however, a window can also be a mirror. And so there's that chance for us to sort of discover part of ourselves, just as we're learning about other places, other peoples, learning more about our neighbors through the act of being in language class. And I just wanted to sort of focus in on a few more of her words that I think are relevant as we select our materials. So she says, when children cannot find themselves reflected in the books they read, or when the images they see are distorted, negative, or laughable, they learn a powerful lesson about how they are devalued in the society of which they are a part. And I think that really speaks to sort of the weight of what it means to choose texts in our courses and how that may, there's a real power dynamic that we have as the teachers, that we're the ones calling those shots and each of us sort of has a different place in the power dynamics of our society. So when I think about myself as an educated upper middle class white woman living in the suburb of a major city in the Northeast, I have a lot of power and privilege that I'm bringing to the act of curation. And I think I also have a natural tendency to choose texts that please me or that make me look good. And so I, I think it's important that we think carefully about what we're choosing and what message it sends to our students who come from so many different backgrounds, far more than we can probably even imagine. 
and how important it is for students to see themselves in texts. And as a little white girl, girl in Western Massachusetts, I always saw myself in texts. I could walk into the library and pick a million books about kids who looked just like me. And I didn't know it at the time, but that was an incredible privilege. And I think for a long time, I selected other materials like that for my students. And that was not serving my students of color well. That was not serving my boys well either. So really thinking about being um, the provider of mirrors to all of our students. And to my point earlier, children from dominant social groups have always found their mirrors in books, but they too have suffered from the lack of ability of books about others. They need the books as windows onto reality, not just on imaginary world. And so I think here, when we think about how can we provide, you know, for those of us who teach in districts that are largely homogenous in terms of makeup, uh, students who may not have the opportunity may not have the opportunity to travel or interact much with other groups, what, how can our course function as a window? And that the fact that we may be in an environment that's very homogenous is no reason to say, oh, my students don't need this. My students don't need to learn about how other people operate in this world. And, and I think that argument is alive and well today. Um, so how is it that we bring a, a, just a great, great variety of voices to all of our students? And what's really beautiful about our profession is that this ties in perfectly with everything that we know about great world language teaching. So if we think about the five C's, that is very much linked to this work. And then if you look inside the circle, the three smaller circles, knowing myself, engaging with the world, exploring communities, that, that inner circle is definitely part of what it means to engage in an anti-bias curriculum. And then if you look on the right, these four words, which come from learning for justice, which you may know better as formally teaching for tolerance, these are their social justice standards. And so when they talk about identity, diversity, justice, action, you know, that ties in so closely with the work we're already doing. And I think it's quite possible for us to be choosing course materials that really bring that social justice message to our students in a way that's perfectly aligned with what we want to be accomplishing in world language courses with communication and sort of opening our students' eyes to the world and letting them talk about themselves in the target language today. So what is our job? What is our responsibility as teachers? We need to know our students, right? Because how can we provide a mirror if we don't know what we're mirroring? And so I'm gonna share some ideas just about how can we effectively know our students in order to provide that mirror for them. And then we also need to know our target cultures in order to provide the windows. And this is tricky, right? When I was taught French, I pretty much only learned about France in the hexagon. We didn't even really talk about Quebec. And these days, you know, you know, with the internet and the world we live in and the growth of Africa is the center of the French speaking world, we really need to be going around the whole globe with most, many of the languages that we teach. And that's going to probably involve some new learning and sort of facing our own ignorance and just trying to kind of get in there and figure out what might work in our courses. And so I very intentionally put target cultures here in the plural. And then by if we have the mirrors and we have the windows, then we provide the opportunity for students to have that sliding door experience where they're sort of able to step out into the world and see something new, which I think is really exciting. So let's kind of dive into this particular topic of some ways to know our students with the goal of being able to provide powerful texts that can serve as mirrors to them. So I just wanted to share a little bit of a survey that I started giving my students a couple years ago when I went for my national board certification and I had to kind of show that my curriculum was suited to these students. And I was like, oh, well, what do I exactly do I know about these students and how would I get more information beyond the stuff that my school already gave me? Um, so this is something that I do at the beginning of the year. It's definitely not too late in mid-October if you haven't had a chance yet. And I just wanted to highlight for you three pieces on the survey. Lower left corner, knowing students' pronouns. There was an article about this in the Boston Globe last week that spoke very, very powerfully about how we are literally saving students' lives 
when we ask for their pronouns in a respectful and private way. Uh, that students feel valued when we do that and that we are providing an opportunity for them to share something very important about themselves that is really essential in some cases to their mental health and their mental health well-being, which is obviously so sacred in 2021. So asking for students' pronouns, then you can think about what's the world language lesson that's gonna go with the, what the answers you get. That's a topic for another day, but a good one. Um, another one is to ask not only like what students, what languages students know, but I particularly like, and I wish I knew who I stole this from, asking, do you speak? Do you hear? Do you read any languages other than English at home? And the reason I like asking it this way is I often learn that many of my students are sort of passive bilinguals to parents who are speaking a Chinese language, an Indian language at home. And I often also hear students who are able to read a language like Greek or Hebrew because of religious background that they don't actually speak or couldn't understand spoken. Um, but it's so great to sort of know how kids are connected to different languages. And there's a lot of cool connections we can make from that to our courses. And then I just, I love to include a really open-ended question, something I want my teacher to know about me. I kind of think of this as like a Rorschach because you just get back whatever the kid wants to tell you and you have no idea. So some of the ones I got this year, a student shared with me that he's Muslim, um, which is a very small minority group in our community where I teach. One student shared with me that his father is a neurosurgeon. And at first I thought he was kind of trying to show off. And then I understood that this is a child who's very concerned about his father's health because of the COVID pandemic. Um, which has helped me understand some of the mental health challenges he's facing this year. Another student wrote to me, I'm not good at reading aloud. And that was actually great for me to know because I have a habit of just calling students randomly to read aloud. And I knew with that student that I was gonna wanna have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with her before I did that so that she would feel safe in my room and that I was gonna let her kind of take the lead on when she wanted to read aloud in my class. So. Just some ideas about getting to know our students. Of course, our students come from home environments. And so I also really um, have found it incredibly valuable to send home an introductory letter, paper copy, digital copy to parent guardians and to hear, really acknowledge them as the experts about their children and sort of open up that in my classroom, parents have a voice and I, I care what you think. Uh, which I think buys you a lot as the year goes on and you may need that currency for other things that may happen throughout the year. And then you also, you might learn something for real about the kid, which is great. You also learn what the parent's view of the child is. And, and, and as those of you who are parents know, kids can present very differently at home than they do in class. And it's, it's great to know that early on in the year. Uh, some of the things that I learned from this letter this year, one, one parent explained that the child was going between two households and I hadn't realized that. So that was very helpful for me to think about giving the child two sets of materials so they wouldn't have to have everything going back and forth between the mom and the dad's house. One parent wrote, give my child lots of grammar and vocabulary homework. And that was really helpful for me to know because this is a child who's taking French six, which is a very light course with no homework that meets every other day with a novice mid target. And I really saw that and thought, ooh, I wanna reach out to that parent and kind of give them a reality check about what this course is gonna look like and provide resources if the child wants to go beyond, you know, there's lots of options for that, but that they would not be disappointed when they did not see a lot of grammar and vocabulary homework coming back home from me. Uh, several parents commented, no surprise, um, when it says my child learns best, my child learns best in person. They need to go to school, right? So uh, that was not a surprise to hear this year. And then that's also something you can reference in your letters to parents. I, I heard from so many of you that in-school learning is so powerful and I'm, I'm thrilled to be doing that with your kids. It's just like a great way to build connection and trust with families. So that's about knowing our students. The next point I was making is about how do we know our target cultures? And obviously this is different for each one of us in all the different languages we teach. Uh, a phrase that I love for doing this work is diversify your feed. So if you are using social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, what have you, YouTube, to collect authentic resources, really think about who you're following. Because if I started by only following the teachers that I know, I would mostly be following a lot of other white women from the Northeast. And that is not gonna help me diversify my feed. 
So now if I see a black teacher who teaches French anywhere, I'm like, oh, follow, follow, follow. That's like perfect. If I can be following the embassies around the world of different French speaking countries, that is terrific. Um, anything from Quebec, that helps me so much. And then I'm able to sort of in my head, I have like my running list of thematic units that I'm always collecting for. And as I'm scrolling, my scrolling has a point, right? I'm not wasting hours on social media. I am curating and looking for perfect resources that I can plug in. Asking for help. If you know what you're looking for and you can articulate it, people want to help each other. And so if you're not on Twitter, I really can't say enough about it. Using this hashtag LangChat with any sort of question is really kind of magical. Maybe you wrote a thematic unit where you, you wrote a learning target that students were gonna be able to understand names and ages from a video about introductions. And now you only have one video about introductions and it's like all white kids from Paris and you need to spice it up. Okay, so this is your chance to reach out. I am looking for diverse speakers of French introducing themselves. Could anyone share a resource with me? Hashtag LangChat. And that can be a really great way to not dig into the whole mess of the internet yourself and find something that's worked for another teacher in their context. Adding a place name to your Google search can help a lot. And then obviously there's lots of pre-curated resources. So if you can find a teacher whose judgment you trust on Pinterest and kind of dig through their stuff, Leslie Gron is always one of my favorites for that. That's a wonderful, wonderful place to start. And then I wanted to share this diversity wheel, which is from John Hopkins University, that just shows, you know, I think when we think of diversity, probably each of us goes to a certain set of categories. And I really liked here that they brought in religion, income, gender expression, political belief, and, and you know, really taking the time to sort of go through our courses. I noticed this is color coding. Maybe there's a little color coding happening in some of your lesson plans. When are the moments in your course that these different identities are, are made visible to your students and are valued and are respected and are present? This is not a real rule, but I have an awesome colleague at the high school whose name is Maria DiPietro. And when she and I were talking about how I was going to diversify my French curricula at the middle school, she gave me this idea of the rule of three. And basically the idea is if you're gonna represent a place, particularly a place with which your students are not super familiar, Instead of giving them one school in Burkina Faso, which then will become, oh, I know about school in Burkina Faso, I've seen one school, that is it, can you try and give them three so that they're seeing some diversity within the place? Now, I teach novices. We're not going to do three places and three in each and have it be nine. That is too much for us. But maybe in the school unit, I say we're going to talk about France and we're going to talk about Burkina Faso. And in the food unit, we're gonna talk about Quebec and we're gonna talk about Senegal. I find for middle schoolers and particularly United States students with very limited education and geography, two places is about what we can handle. Sometimes I tried to be fancy and do like one from each of five places. And then I would start hearing things like, wait, was that in Cameroon or Quebec? And I was like, okay, that should be really clear. Like those are not two places we should be confusing with each other. But it was, it was just a little bit much for uh, kids at this level with that limited knowledge of geography to be doing so many places. So I think we want to get to lots of places around the world, but let's go a little deeper and try to pr um, provide some depth. And I'm going to be honest, I didn't do Burkina Faso for my school unit. I looked up two of these three two nights ago, and it took me like three minutes to find two more. It was not hard. And these are novice friendly resources. Another way to approach this, if you are in a systematic department that organizes such things, would be to think about, could every year of the course focus on maybe two places? And then for every unit, you know, I'm looking for examples from Senegal and I'm looking for examples from Quebec or whatever it's gonna be. And next year they will do France and they will do Cote d'Ivoire or Algeria or whatever it's gonna be. Um, but I think that's, a you know, just to try to get us a little bit out of our places of colonizing the language and really around the world into the diversity of where that language is spoken.
So what I wanted to do now, this is going to be a little bit of an imagination game, so I'm just going to trust you here, is can you think, and I will give you like 30 seconds of good thinking time, think about a resource that you are currently using in your teaching, like maybe something that you're going to be showing students this week or next week. And then I'm going to ask you to reflect on that resource. So just take 30 seconds and see if you can think of a particular video, a particular reading, a particular story that you use. Okay, so I'm a super concrete person. Teaching middle school probably doesn't help. And I just want to try to run your resource against a series of questions. This is a very text heavy slide. So we are not going to dive into the details here. Uh, but I did want to point out to you that here we have reading diversity light, a tool for selecting diverse text. And basically what we have is an opportunity to write the name of the resource at the top and then to review these questions and think about which ones are yeses and which ones are noes. Not expecting to find the 100% perfect text that checks every box, but trying to pay attention to what are some areas that are really not getting a lot of love in my courses right now where I could bring a little more energy and attention. So I wanted to take a look at a piece of this slide uh, and then another piece of the list separately. And the beginning of this very much recalls the diversity wheel that we saw a bit earlier. So thinking about what are the voices in this text? Race, ethnicity, gender, class, age, ability, religion, place, that's our around the world, immigration status, LGBTQ identity. And then thinking about will those experiences or identities sort of contribute to the student's overall experience? So how's that going to add to the collection that we're building in the course? Um, does this text accurately reflect lived experiences? And here I just want to own, this is very tricky, right? To be an expert in all the target cultures of your language is impossible. And as the curator, you are trying to use your best judgment about whether or not this seems accurate. And I certainly know whenever anyone's interviewed me for anything, afterwards I look at it and I'm like, oh, that's not exactly what I meant, or that's not quite what I said. So we're always a little bit off from where we're heading, um, but you know, we wanna try to do the best we can. When we think about the beliefs within the text, we can also be looking for is the author promoting inclusion and equality? Like, what's the message of the text? Um, is it relying on stereotypes? Does it address a stereotype without sort of believing in it? And then also, who's left out? You know, and I think that's hard to see, right? Our books are full of people and places. Who, who do we not see? Who is missing? Um, and again, I think having something like a checklist or the wheel can hopefully help us pinpoint some groups that we really want to target to bring into the course in a more substantial way going forward. If we just take another slice of that big list, um, we've got here this idea of mirrors and windows connecting to the interests of our students, right? I think, you know, I'm a 47 year old woman. The things that I find interesting are not interesting to 11 year old boys. So I have to stretch a little bit to think about how is this gonna connect to my students? I might need to call on some of my daughter's friends and figure out what they're talking about, what games they're interested in playing, what sports they like, what teams in order to sort of find what's gonna be relevant. And then I just wanted to share again this image um, that I showed earlier in terms of anti-bias education, having these four parts. And just maybe as you're reflecting on whatever course material you selected for this little imaginary exercise, in terms of identity, do you think this is promoting a healthy view of self and exploration? In terms of diversity, is it fostering understanding between different groups? That's a lot to ask of a text, but there might be some that can do it. 
Justice, is this a text that's going to help students see the injustice in the world, help them confront prejudice? And then this action step, and I think for you know those of us who teach novices or middle schoolers, we're at like the very first step of the journey. But there is, a, is there a way that when students interact with these materials that they want to stand up against injustice or that they are reading about people who have stood up? Uh, today, I got my little French newsletter for young readers in France, Un jour en actu, and there was a whole article about Greta Thunberg and then other kids who are fighting for environmental justice. That's like a great example of a text that's trying to highlight individual struggles and promote students' involvement in them. So here's that big list. This is our moment for some audience participation. I would love for you to just scan this list. Which of these are sort of already on your radar when you're choosing course materials? And then you could just drop that number or numbers in the chat. So for example, I would say um, I am definitely looking for texts that would be windows. If you look at number nine, I'm always looking for texts that can be windows for my students. So I'm going to type into the chat, sending it to everyone in meeting a number nine. OK, so I'm just going to leave that open for a minute. You can scan, you can think, you can add a number or two. People are definitely looking to connect with their students' interests. Windows. Does it accurately reflect lived experience? That's so important. But if we don't have direct knowledge, I think that can be an intimidating one. Are there stereotypes in the in the materials? Yeah, and that was definitely one of the things that I was so happy to be done with when I got rid of my textbook. I'm just going to leave it up for another 10 seconds if anyone else wants to jump in or add another number. Awesome. Great. OK, thank you. Thank you for your participation. So those are some things we're already thinking about even before I started this talk. And my next question is the opposite. What's something that you haven't considered much in the past, but that you might want to in the future? So this is kind of the stretch. How do you want to challenge yourself? Where's somewhere that you could grow? And then uh, they say that committing to the step publicly is the way you get yourself to do it. So if you want to commit by typing in that number in the chat, I will pick one as well. And uh, we'll do this for another minute. All right, people are looking to pay attention to the gaps, which is definitely challenging. I commend you. Just leave us another 10 seconds if you want to add another or if you haven't had a chance. Great. All right. Thank you. Well, I hope that will be a first step. And just for those of you who said you want to consider the gaps and silences, I would just point out that doing this work with someone else can often be a way to surface that. That if you talk with someone else, they might very well notice something that's missing that didn't jump out to you. So just a, a, a plug for working together, working smarter, not harder. OK, so I just wanted to introduce um, a resource that I have found very helpful that I discovered through my school called the seven forms of bias in instructional materials and I'm just going to go through this quick um, just to give you a sense of what's in there and it's certainly something you can easily google and come back to on your own so the first one again to those of you who chose 
kind of looking for the gaps in the silence is to think about what don't we see? And there's some groups listed here who tend to be absent from our materials. And what I like about the setup, these materials came to me from our school librarian, Sarah Chessman, who adapted them from the Sadker Foundation, is that there's this questions to consider. So when you look at materials, you can ask yourself, who is represented? Who is missing? And then if there is bias, how will you address it? So it's not how will you burn this material and never use it again, but what can you what can you do with this that will allow it to sort of be an organic part of your course without pretending to represent everything about the target cultures, for example. So paying attention to invisibility. I wanted to share this list from Julia Koch, who's your neighbor in New Jersey, who has this diversity and inclusivity checklist, not unlike the diversity wheel, that might be a way to sort of go through and just think about, you know, do you have anything that addresses immigration status? Do you have anything that uh, addresses physical disability? Do you have examples of rural, urban, and suburban language users, et cetera? So you might check that out as a resource. Then our second one is about stereotyping. And we still see lots and lots of stereotypes. Some of my favorite French media resources have some really awful stereotypes in them still. Um, stuff that I, I'm pretty proud to say you would never see in an American educational publication, but you still might see in a French one. So just noticing stereotypes. And then again, how will you address them? It doesn't mean that that's never part of your curriculum, but trying to you know be upfront with students, ask them sometimes to see what they notice, and then talking about it. Imbalance and selectivity is the idea that you're getting part of the information, you're getting one perspective, and that there might be some important perspectives missing. Okay, for example, I love this one about math and science courses typically reference European discoveries and formulas, right? I think that's probably also in our courses typically represent, represent European made art and music. So how do we broaden that? Then the next one, and I think this is tricky in world language because often I think there's an expectation um, that we teach the fun class and so we shouldn't be too heavy. And so we don't want to have that let us turn to rose colored glasses and putting um, sort of a film of positivity over things that can be really ugly and problematic. And so just trying to find that balance that we're not glossing over realities, but we're also not terrifying or paralyzing our students, particularly at a time when they're already pretty traumatized and have, are living through a pandemic, right? So that's, that's a tricky balance. This next one, and if you have taught from a textbook, you probably know it, is that idea of like the special chapter, or I think I was mentioning, I used to have this textbook, French textbook, where there was one page about Haiti. And I still remember there was a sentence in it that said, Haitians, are happy, artistic, and hardworking people. And that took like a 20 minute English language conversation with my students to unpack. And it was just like, oh man, why, why do we have this page? I just ripped the page out of the book at this point. Um, so just trying, you know, trying to be honest with our students and trying to think about how do we make this a holistic experience that we're not waiting for Black History Month to talk about African American cultures in our class, for example. Linguistic bias. Now, this was not prepared for a world language teacher audience, but certainly thinking about how do we bring the diversity of linguistic variations into our class, a diversity of accents, thinking about words in the languages that we're teaching that may have offensive origins that we want to consider as we talk to our students. And then the last one is cosmetic bias or shiny covers. So if you're old enough to remember the old Benetton ads, this might speak to you. But this would be, you know, the idea where the book has, and actually, I don't know if anyone's here on for my district, but every year our superintendent opens the year with a slideshow about our district that has all these pictures of racially diverse children who are not from our district, which is majority white, that are in the background. And like, it looks great, but it's not, it's a total shiny cover that does not represent the truth of our district. Um, and so just kind of thinking about like, is there genuine equity or is this an illusion of equity? And I did want to take a couple minutes to speak about a cause that is very close to my heart, which is cosmetic bias around the month of December and the way that world language teachers talk about holidays in December. 
my experience is that this becomes a major, major time to talk about and sometimes celebrate Christmas in schools that are not religious schools. So if you are teaching in a public school or a secular school, I would really rethink the idea that December is the time to talk about holidays because we usually want to do this in December because it is the month of Christmas, okay? December is not an important month on the Jewish calendar. And in Islam, it's a lunar calendar with the holidays rotating all 12 months. So there's no one holiday that's always in December. So trying to respect the authentic calendars of different faiths really requires talking about holidays all year long. And if you are a person for whom Christmas is really important, this might re really require quite a big cultural shift. You might not be thinking about major holidays the first two weeks of school. That's when the Jewish holidays, the major Jewish holidays fell this year. You might not be thinking about other major holidays in the spring, okay? But that's when we've got Passover. So it's just, um, I think sometimes we try to make it okay by adding in Christmas, adding in Diwali, adding in any um, Eid that might be falling in December that year. Um, I would argue that's really a cosmetic fix on a deeper problem. And I love this tweet, if you don't follow Natasha, you definitely should, that including diverse texts alone is not anti-racist. So we can recognize our students' identities, we can expose them to diverse voices, but that is different than actually fighting racism by teaching against white supremacy. And so one of the examples, when I read this, I was kind of like, whoa, mind blown. And then I also was like, where do I start with sixth graders with this? And I loved her first example was, so when we talk about French being spoken in North Africa, we need to talk to our students, why are people speaking French in North Africa? How did that happen? Oh, okay, violent colonization, right? And sort of making sure that we're really upfront with students about the power dynamics that have contributed to the map of the languages as they exist today. I just wanted to give some concrete examples because there's no good conference presentation if you don't have concrete examples from the classroom. So this is a book I absolutely love. It's about dandies in the Congo. Um, and I love the geographic diversity that it brings in. It's a very different view of West Africa than my students tend to have, but it's too hard. The text is really complex. So a way that you might handle that would be to write a teacher version paraphrased of the story. And then, for example, tell the book, tell the story with your own words and the pictures, and then have students do some exercises where, for example, they're rearranging the text, showing that they understand it. I like the Text of Aid website for that. Thinking about art as an authentic resource can be a really nice way to fill in some gaps if you're having a hard time finding materials. So diverse families can provide a mirror and a window experience. This is an example from my sixth grade classroom where I share paintings from the French speaking world, like this painting of a family from Haiti, as a way to just talk about different families, who's in the family, what's the climate, do you think this is a painting from today or from the past? And when I first heard that art could be an authentic resource, I kind of resisted it because I was like, there's no text, how can that be? And Leslie Grand put me in my place and let me know art totally counts and you can uh, elicit tons of language from students by talking about art. So I say go for it. I'm a convert. Thinking about doing jigsaws where students might explore a similar topic but from different places. So I might have some students studying poutine from Canada and other students studying poule yassa from Senegal and then they can do a share out in pairs where each one talks about what they learned to the other. So there's an authentic information gap. Again, I think two places is about what kids can keep straight. And then again, I just want to share a couple slides about this idea of marking time. I mentioned earlier sort of the December holiday dilemma. And I just wanted to share again in the spirit of concrete examples, this was an email that I got last December in my school from our Diversity Equity Action Committee. And some of its main points were, not everyone celebrates a major holiday in December. Try saying winter break instead of saying Christmas break. Think about saying December holidays instead of the holidays, right? When we say the holidays, we know what you mean, but it's referring to one group of holidays. 
And then in our school, it's already pretty common practice. People do not dress up in Christmas outfits. They do not have Christmas lights. They do not have Christmas decorations. Um, but then I think sometimes what happens is like, oh, I really miss that stuff. I love it. How about we make it holiday? So I've got my Hanukkah sweater and my, my Hanukkah lights and my menorah in the classroom. And then thinking about what does that mean if we're sort of just substituting that for something that's is really pretty much about Christmas? And what does that mean for students who do not celebrate those holidays at all? So I think there can be a very warm, fuzzy desire to create community in terms of the intent. My own experience as a Jewish parent of Jewish kids in public school is that the impact can be quite, quite different and, and not at all what these lovely, lovely teachers intended. So in that spirit, our school has this very cool calendar that lists all these different holidays with updated dates for the year and which religion they come from. And then we have announcements on our PA system letting folks know what's going on. And our express intention here is to give a little more attention to holidays that kids don't know about. So this is the PA announcement you will hear at our school. Are you curious about what some people in our Wellesley Middle School community will be celebrating? This begins the holiday of, hmm, we tell you about it. There are students at WMS who will be observing this holiday. We wish all people observing this holiday and then whatever the wish is. So like an easy fast, um, a meaningful new year, et cetera. Um, so just something to think about. I do think it's kind of exciting to imagine that world language teachers might be the folks to lead the charge on this. I think we have the skill set already to do it. And I think it's a gift that each of us could potentially bring to our school communities. With that, I just wanted to talk a tiny bit about some feelings that we might have as we sort of start on this work and that we might be blaming ourselves or regretting things we've done in the past. And so Brene Brown says that blame has an inverse relationship with accountability and that accountability is a vulnerable process. And if we get involved in blame, we miss that opportunity for empathy and it might kind of cause us to not have an opportunity to make ourselves accountable at all. So I would just invite all of you to let go of the blame. Think about from this presentation, is there one way that you could be more accountable to your students in terms of providing an anti-bias education and sort of breaking free of those chains as you operate as the curator of the materials in your courses. So I'm really delighted to have spent this time with you. This is just the beginning of the conference. There's lots and lots ahead. Uh, Rich mentioned my Twitter handle earlier, but my last name is impossible to spell. So I've got it here as well as my blog. If you're a French teacher, I share lots and lots of resources there. And yeah, if anyone wants to tweet the change that they're committing to, I will be looking for you on Twitter later tonight. Thanks so much. Nothing beats that silent clap, am I right? Rebecca, merci, merci. What a pleasure to host you. Um, I, think, I think this session is absolutely a great place to start and certainly on brand for the rest of our conference. Um, at this point, uh, I, I recommend, and I'll put in the chat as well, if you would like to, uh, would like to fill out the session evaluation form, you can find it in the chat. Uh, if you would like Act 48 credit for uh, for this session, I've also posted it in the chat. And of course, um, as I mentioned before, and I will show you one more time, um, you can find you can find both of these forms um, in our in our program. Um, so once again, if you were to go, for example, to the schedule overview, you can find both of these forms right here. At this point, um, as we close this session, um, we will have some conference organizers present in the uh, support rooms. We'll be here for one hour. So if it is 4.55 right now, I'll say we'll be there till just before six o'clock. So you can feel free to pop in if you have any questions or any concerns. If you are a presenter specifically, there'll be some folks in here. And if you're an attendee and you just want some help getting around the conference, we will be there as well. But otherwise, 
thank you very much for everything, Rebecca and everybody here. And I look forward to seeing everybody very soon. Thanks, Thanks everyone.